Do you have your Bibles with you? Amen. Amen. We're going to be studying the Bible this evening. Amen? Before we get into making butter. Before we get into the Word of God this evening, as it is our tradition, I want to invite you to have a word of prayer with me. Let's ask for the Spirit of God to be our teacher individually, and please keep me in your prayers as well, that the Lord will inspire my mind and use me for His honor and glory, that His Word might go forth. Amen? So I'm going to kneel right now and invite you. I invite you to kneel with me as we go before the throne of God. And let's just take the next 60 seconds, all of us, individually. Let's seek the face of God and ask him to have his own way within our lives. And then when you hear my voice, I'll be closing us out in prayer. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you again for bringing us safely into your courts this evening. Thank you for the blessing of having your holy word, which is indeed a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. And Lord, in this world that is filled with darkness, we need light. Uh, the enemy has set snares for us at every step. And if it were not for the power of thy grace, we could not stand. But Lord, we look unto Jesus this evening as the author of our salvation, as our rock, as our tower. We look to him, Lord, as the only source of our righteousness. And we ask, please, let this mind be in us, which was also in Christ Jesus. Father, this evening as we go to study your word, I'm truly praying that you would be the one to impress these prophetic, solemn truths upon our hearts. When we leave your courts, may we leave, Lord, with a new mindset, one that is single for the glory and honor of thy name. Please take full, possess, full control of my being, my mind, my mouth, Lord, I just want you to have your own way with me and through me. Thank you for hearing this humble prayer. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite you to open your Bibles with me this evening. We're going to the book of Matthew. Where are you going in your Bibles? Matthew chapter 24. Very familiar chapter to all of us here. Because these are the words of Jesus Christ himself concerning the final events. When his disciples asked him in Matthew chapter 24 about what signs would mark the event of the destruction of Jerusalem, his second coming, and the end of the world. Are you with me thus far? In Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 4, Jesus begins to answer their inquiry and he says first, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. For ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. Why? For nation shall rise up against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there shall be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places, and all these are the beginnings of sorrows. Now, you've heard these verses of Scripture I don't know how many times. But brothers and sisters, these verses of Scripture are more relevant than when you heard them the first time or the second time. Quite frankly, the last time. Are you with me right now? These verses of Scripture are present truth. Nation rising up against nation. That's races rising up against other races. Racial tension is in existence. Is it in existence? Yes. For those of you that have been watching what's going on in the United States of America, we have a situation of division in our nation that we have not seen since the 1960s. It's a reality. Kingdom against kingdom. 
Are you seeing what's going on on the television nowadays? You see what's going on in the newspapers. You see it when you go on the internet. When you see nations talking about the possibility of nuclear conflict, you know something is wrong. These types of discussions shouldn't even be on the table. But God said this would be what would be in these last days. Famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. The word of God lets us know that these things are the beginning of the labor pangs. They are the events that foreshadow a time of deliverance. We've talked about this before. The word of God lets us know what is going to transpire after we see these things coming to their climactic head. We're living in that time right now. It's extremely clear. The Bible tells us, looking at verse 9 of Matthew chapter 24, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and they shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So the word of God is clear. God's people are getting ready to be delivered into a time of trouble. Is the Bible not saying that? Yes. As we're seeing these things taking place, and we're saying, yes, there's turmoil in the world, yes. The nations are angry. Then brothers and sisters, all of these things are letting us know the crisis is at the doorstep of the children of the living God. The first thing that will happen shortly from now, the Bible says it. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted. Who are the they that are going to deliver us up to be afflicted? Is that a good question? Don't you want to know who's going to deliver you up to be afflicted? Go with me to Matthew chapter 10, Matthew the 10th chapter, and we're going to look at verse 21. Matthew chapter 10, looking at verse 21. This is what the Bible says. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall rise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. Who are the they that are going to deliver us up to be afflicted? The police, the military, the CIA, the FBI. The Bible says your very own brother, your very own father, your very own children that you breastfed, that you cleaned, that you paid for. Are you with me right now? That you cooked for. These same children will rise up against you, mommy and daddy, and they will be your persecutors. Serious situation. Our very own family members. Then shall they, who? Your brother, your father, your mother, your own children. And who are they going to deliver us up to? The word of God tells us. Go with me to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 13. We're looking at verse 9. Mark the 13th chapter. We're going to begin at the 9th verse. Please, when you arrive there, just let me know. Say amen. Are you with me in the Bible right now? In Mark chapter 13, looking at the 9th verse, the Bible says this. Listen closely. But take heed to yourselves, for they shall do what? Deliver you up to the councils, and in their synagogues ye shall be beaten. Yea, what, what did the, are you with me in the Bible right now? Come on. Are you really with me in the Bible? Let's go right back. But take heed to yourselves. Why? For they will deliver you up to the councils, and in their synagogues ye shall be beaten, and ye shall be brought, and ye shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake and for testimony against them. So where will, we be, where will we be delivered up to? The Bible says to these councils. And these councils will consist of rulers and kings, political. Are you with me so far? These are civil authorities. Civil authorities, God's people will be delivered up to. For what purpose? For his namesake and that we might deliver a testimony that will stand in the day of judgment against them. Brothers and sisters, there's a crisis that's before us. We're told by the servant of the Lord that very shortly from now, each and every one of us are going to have to stand for ourselves to give a reason for the faith that's in us. We ourselves will have to stand before these kings, these rulers, these judges, these worldly wise men that have a knowledge of history, that have some knowledge of quote-unquote theology. And we are told that in that hour, many of us, even those who are supposed to be pastors and elders will become confused and give up our faith. You won't have somebody to lean on in that hour. 
So you better learn from now to lean on Jesus. The Bible says we're going to be delivered up to these councils with these worldly wise men, these civil authorities, these councils. But whose councils are these? I want you to see something what the Bible says on these councils. Go back to Matthew chapter 10. This time we're going to look at verse 17. Matthew chapter 10, looking at the 17th verse. The Bible says this, but beware of men. For they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you in their synagogues. Stop for a second. Did you see what the Bible just said? Yes. The Bible says that they will deliver you up to the councils and they will scourge you, meaning beat you, persecute you in their synagogues. Evidently, these councils own some synagogues. What's a synagogue? Hold on a second. But those councils consist of rulers and kings, civil powers. So you mean to tell me that we're looking at a situation that's going to take place in the future that will bring a union between church and state? Ah. And brothers and sisters, the judge... The courtroom is going to be right here. You're not listening to me. Because this is where you're going to get beaten at. Right here. The synagogue. Brother Chris, why are you saying things like this? That's not nice. That's what the Bible says. Now you can take it or leave it, but that's what the Bible says. And if you think that what we're talking about right now is over the top, it's fanatical, it's irrelevant, I caution you to hold your tongue because you're actually speaking against Jesus. Because according to the mouth of Jesus, he believes that it is of the utmost importance that we understand this. You don't believe me? Then believe Jesus. Go with me to the book of John. Where are we going right now? John chapter 16. John chapter 16, and we're going to look at verse 1. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the 16th chapter, and we're going to look at verse 1. The words of Jesus himself, look what he tells us. These things have I spoken unto you, that ye should not be what? Offended. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh, what? When whosoever killeth you will think that he doeth God's service. Whose words are these? Jesus. And he was warning his disciples, the time is coming that they're going to put you out of the synagogues and the very individuals that will be engaged in your destruction will think that they're doing it all for the glory of God. But notice what Jesus said in verse 1. The first thing he says, these things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. Do you understand what he's telling you? Brothers and sisters, where will these councils be at? Where are they going to be beating you at? Can you imagine in the council, you have your councilmen, you have your prime minister, your president, your pastor, the, the elder that did Bible study with you. The very pastor that baptized you into the church, he's sitting there on the council. Mind you, who brought you into that council? Your child. You're not listening to me right now. Brothers and sisters, can you not see how if Jesus did not forewarn us of what was getting ready to take place, that very easily many of us would be offended? My mother would deliver me to the council? And then the pastor that baptized me would be the one who gives the final condemnation? You're not listening to me. Can you imagine how that would make people become offended? Jesus said, I'm telling you this before it happens so that you are forewarned so that when, is, when it is unfolding, you will not be taken by surprise because this will be something that will try people to the very core of their being. Jesus says, I'm telling you these things now so that when they happen, you won't be offended. 
because your greatest adversaries are not going to come from without. They're going to come from within. The Bible tells us in Matthew chapter 10. Where are you going in your Bible? Matthew the 10th chapter. Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew the 10th chapter. Come on now, brothers and sisters. If you're there, say amen. Matthew chapter 10 and verse 36, the Bible says, And a man's foes shall be they of his what? Own household. Whose words are these again? Jesus. What is he trying to do? Forewarn us so that we will not be offended. A man's foes shall be those of his own household. That is why Jesus gives us the clear warning in the book of Matthew chapter 10, in the beginning of verse 21. He said, but beware of men. Are you listening? He said, but beware of men. What does that mean? That you should be paranoid when you walk around your house looking at your children? You haven't been acting right. I haven't, seen you. I haven't seen you studying your Bible lately. You're going to be the persecutor. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Is God calling us to walk around paranoid of our spouses and etc.? No. When he says, but beware of men, what he's really trying to tell us is, beware of investing the fullness of your trust in men. Because men are going to be the very mediums that the devil uses for your persecution. And not just men, but those of your own household. Beware of investing the fullness of your trust in men. Many spouses invest the fullness of their trust in their spouse. Are you listening right now? Many children invest the fullness of their trust in their parents. Should we trust our parents implicitly? Should we trust our spouses? Yes, but should we set them above the Almighty? The Bible says in the book of Psalms, chapter 146, we're going to begin at verse 3 here. Psalm 146, beginning at the third verse, the Bible tells us here, Put not thy trust in princes, neither in the Son of Man, in whom there is no help, his breath goeth forth, he returneth to his earth, and in that very day his thoughts perish. Why would you invest the fullness of your trust? Why would you place your existence in the hands of another finite man who can be here today and gone tomorrow just like you? Prone to sin. Prone to rebellion. Why would you invest the fullness of your trust in men? Bible once again conveys that warning. Once again, Jeremiah chapter 17. We're going to look at verse 5. Jeremiah chapter 17. What verse are we looking at? Verse 5. In Jeremiah chapter 17, looking at the fifth verse, the Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth in man, and that maketh arm, make, make his, what? flesh his arm arm and whose heart departed from the Lord. The Bible doesn't just say that it's a bad thing to place your trust in man. He says you're cursed if you place your trust fully in man. And if you make flesh your arm, meaning that you look at mortal man as the source of your strength, your helper. The one that will hold you up when you are in need. The word of God said it is foolishness. The man that places his trust in the intellect, the so-called brilliance of the mind of another man to guide his footsteps in this life. You're cursed, the Bible says. If you trust in another man to support you and take care of you, I'm sorry, I can't come to church on Sabbath because... My boss said I can't have the day off. And you know, if I don't listen to Boston, I don't get the paycheck. And if I don't get the paycheck, I can't pay for this. And if I can't pay for this, then I can't do this. And obviously I have no faith because I don't know Jesus. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Because all you're telling me by enumerating all of these different statements is, 
I am, my trust is in the arm of flesh. It's not in the Lord. And that's what God said. He says, cursed is the man that puts his trust in man and that makes flesh his arm whose heart departed from the Lord. Don't you understand that when you make man the source of your strength, your heart can do nothing but depart from the Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? Some of us will run around. I believe, I believe that God's way is the way. We have a message, brothers and sisters, for the restoration of our health. We have eight doctors, eight laws. And then all of a sudden you get sick and you go to the doctor and they tell you that you have some type of cancer. And they tell you, you need to take this round of chemotherapy. This is the only way. And then you consider, well, maybe I should do it because doctor knows what he's talking about. He's the doctor, I'm not. But when God, who made you and the doctor, told you, you're not even listening to what I said, told you that drugs never cure, but then you say, well, the doctor said, yeah, go ahead, put your trust in the doctor. Because your heart is just departing from the Lord. And you can take that scenario and that analogy and flip it upside down and turn it in every different direction that you need to to fit into your own personal circumstance because you know in some way, shape, or form, it does. Do you understand what I just said? Because many of us, in many ways, we have more trust in man than we do in God. You know how I know that's the truth? <laughs> because when problems happen, many a times we scramble, we do this, we do that, we do that, we do that, and then when nothing works, we say, well, all we can do is pray. <laughs> what do you mean, all we can do? I mean, just think about it. If Mark Zuckerberg, you know the guy who owns Facebook? This guy's like multi-billionaire. Bill Gates, you know who he is? Okay, good, good. Just think about it. Bill Gates was my, was my, that's hypothetical, father. <laughs> if Bill Gates was my father, and then I got into a situation where I needed a thousand dollars. Would I be like, well, all I can do is call Bill. <laughs> You're not even listening to me. Would I be like, all I can do is call Bill. I'd be like, I'm calling Bill. Are you understanding what I'm saying? Bill's going to cover $1,000. That's a drop in the bucket for Bill. Yes. How come we don't think about God that same way? Oh, we're running this way, running that way, running this way. Oh, well, all we can do is pray now. Because God's not powerful. See, your words, your words reveal your hearts. All we can do is pray. We have our trust in man and not in the Almighty. Brothers and sisters, listen closely. We've been talking about a lot of things this week, and they have been of the utmost importance. Because we need to understand that the crisis that is right before us, it demands that we have a particular type of character. Because if we are the types of individuals that invest our trust in flesh, we will not be able to endure the crisis. The Bible tells us, go with me, Mark chapter 13, 13. Mark chapter 13, 13. In Mark the 13th chapter, looking at verse 13, the Bible begins by saying, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. Do you see, before we go any further, do you see how if you are an individual that is so, you care so much about the thoughts of other men, you care so much about the praise of men, the admiration of men, the acceptance of men. Do you see how in that hour, you're done? Brothers, how many of you, how many of you in here tonight have had a situation where somebody hated you? <laughs> Look at you. More hands go up than the other day when I asked you if you believe in Jesus. But anyway. <laughs> so... So, 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 think about this, think about this, think about this. 
When that person, you knew this person hated you, all right? You knew they hated you. How did it feel to be in close proximity to this person? And listen to me. When I say this person hated you, you know they hated you to the extent that if it were possible, they would take you out. Now, how did it feel to be in, the, in close proximity to a person like that? Totally uncomfortable, am I right? Okay, you take that feeling and multiply it by billions because we're going to be hated by all men. Are you understanding what I just said? That feeling is going to be magnified by billions. You will literally be the bullseye of the nations. The Bible says right there, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. The Bible says it in different language in Luke chapter 21. Luke chapter 21. We need to be able to endure. That is what God is calling us to. He needs a people that have spiritual endurance. We're looking at the book of Luke chapter 21. And we're going to begin now at verse 17. When you arrive, say amen. It says, and ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake, but there shall not in here of your head perish. Look at verse, are you there now? Look at the next verse. It says, in your patience possess ye your souls. In other words, your salvation depends upon your patience. Brothers and sisters, we must possess a patience that can endure the crisis. Because only those who have patience will secure their souls for eternity. I mean, what type of patience do we need? What type of patience can actually endure this type of crisis that is certainly before the people of God? The Bible actually gives us insight into this in the book of James chapter 5. James, the fifth chapter. What type of patience is fortified? To endure the crisis, the Bible tells us in James chapter 5, beginning at verse 11, it says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, how the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. You see what the Bible says? When it speaks about those who are blessed because they endure, it then points our attention to the patience of Job. Job. It is evident that Job possessed the type of patience that all of us need so that we can endure the crisis. You know what Job's patience looked like, don't you? Matter of fact, go back to Job. Just turn your Bible to Job real quick. We won't go through all of Job, but I know you're familiar with Job. Most of us know about Job. Job once, Job is the book of the Bible that first really brings to our attention the magnitude of of this great controversy, this contest, contest between God and Satan. And we're told how one day, as God was holding counsel with the sons of what? No. Sons, of God. sons of God, have mercy. That Satan came amongst them, am I correct? Yes. And God asked him, where are you coming from? He said, from, and from going up and down in it. Basically saying, just making sure that my whole kingdom is in check, everything is in order, and God looks at him and says, yeah, yeah, what about Job? Job was that one bright shining light in the midst of planet Earth that the devil did not have under his stronghold. He despised the fact that God could actually address the existence of Job. That's why he responds the way that he did. First, he tries to ignore the existence of Job, but then when God brings him up, okay, then you think he's fearing you for nothing. Are you listening to what I'm saying? He says, Job doesn't just fear you for no reason. It's because you bless him. Take away the blessings. He'll curse you to your face. God says, okay, take away everything you want to, but don't take my servants. So what does he do? One day, houses, land, children, servants, every earthly possession that Job had was totally removed from him in one day. Everything.
brothers and sisters, hold on a second. Yeah, I know you've read this story before. Think about it. Some of us lose our cell phone and we want to give up Jesus. This man lost every earthly possession. Not just, not just, not just little trinkets. He lost his very children. One day, devil took everything from him, except for one thing. Go with me to Job chapter 2. Are you with me right now? Job chapter 2 and verse 9. The Bible says, then said his wife unto him, dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. Devil left behind the wife. Brothers and sisters, it wasn't coincidental. Wait a second, hold on a second. Was this a coincidence? No. It was not coincidental. Every move that took place that day was calculated by Satan for the purpose of the overthrow of the faith of Job. The devil left Job's wife around because he knew he could use her as an agent. Family members, husbands, is the devil using you as an agent in the home to break down your wife that's trying to grow in Jesus Christ? She's fighting and you know she is. She's getting up in the morning pleading and you see it. Are you that medium that Satan is using to try to bring down your spouse? Wives? Is Satan using you in the home? To discourage your husband from giving himself fully to the service of the Lord? Are you, like Job's wife saying, why are you maintaining your integrity towards God? You don't have a good job right now. Forget this Sabbath business. Curse God. Bible tells us though, Job turns around in verse 10, but he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God and not receive evil what? Are you with me right now? Yes. Shall we receive good at the hand of God and not receive evil what? Is it in your Bible? As it is mine? Yes. The Bible says in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. I love Job's response. His wife says to him, curse God and die. Job turns around and says to her, you speak like one of those foolish women speaketh. You know, sometimes we got to be like that. You speak like one of those foolish women speaketh. Brothers and sisters, I think in these last days, we're going to have to say those same words like Job. Yes. You know, you sound like one of those foolish women. <laughs> what am I talking about? What can a woman stand as a symbol of in the Bible? Sure. Jeremiah 6 and verse 2 tells us, I've likened the daughter of Zion unto a comely and delicate woman. Does the Bible speak of any foolish churches? Jeremiah 51. Where are we going in our Bibles right now? Jeremiah. The book of Jeremiah, chapter 51. Let's go to verse 7. Jeremiah, chapter 51 and verse 7. Are there any foolish women spoken of in the scripture? In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 51. Are you there now? Looking at verse 7, the Bible says, Babylon hath been a golden cup in the Lord's hand, which hath made all the earth drunken. The nations have drunken of her wine. Therefore, the nations are mad. That word mad means that when you drink the wine of ba Babylon, you become a fool. Are you following right now? Are there, any, are there any churches that have been drinking the wine of Babylon? Are you sure? The Bible tells us, go with me, Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. We're going to verse 5. Revelation chapter 17, looking at verse 5. The word of God tells us there, speaking of the prophetic language, po pointing to the great antichrist system. The Bible says here, Revelation 17 and verse 5, and upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. That's mother, she has daughter, so there's a lot of foolish women out here. Yeah. 
brothers and sisters, I wonder if in these last days we are going to have to say to some people, I wonder if in these last days we might be in the church one day and a preacher may be in the pulpit and say, brothers and sisters, as I was home last night, I was studying the Bible and the angel of the Lord spoke with me and told me that we really do not need to hold fast to this thing of the seventh day. We've had it wrong. And in that hour, I wonder if some of us will have a close enough relationship with the Lord that in that hour, we will respectfully raise our hand and say, Pastor, I don't know if I heard that right, but it sounded like me that you were speaking like one of those foolish women speaketh. Brothers and sisters, many of us are preparing to speak like the foolish women. Listening to T.D. Jakes and Creflo Dollar and Joe Oilstein and reading The Purpose Driven Life and... We have to go to Babylon to get all of its corrupt content as if we don't have pure provender in the house of the living God. Just spit out the bones. Don't even bother with them. You're not even hearing me right now. <laughs> Just spit out the bones. I gave up bones a long time ago. I eat a total plant-based diet. <laughs> You're not even listening to me. <laughs> You're not even listening to me. Are they listening right now? What do you mean just spit out the bones? Why do I want corruption when I have the pure word of God? Amen. Brothers and sisters, many of us are setting ourselves up to be like those foolish women. But the Bible tells us that Job maintained his integrity and he did not even curse God. He did not even sin against God with his very lips. You know there's another group of people in the Bible that have, a similar, that have similar characteristic traits as Job. They're spoken of in Revelation 14 and verse 1. In Revelation chapter 14 and verse 1, it says this. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and, of, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. Jump down over to verse 4. When you arrive there, say amen. It says, these are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. You know, the only type of woman that can defile in the Bible is a harlot. So they're not defiled with the harlotry of Babylon. Just the same way that Job said, you speak like one of those foolish women speak. I'm not giving heed to your counsel. These are they that are not defiled with women, for they are virgins. Are you with me right now? Yes. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. Now look at verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile. They didn't even sin against God with their lips. Brothers and sisters, Job stands as a type of those who will live in these last days when every earthly support is cut off. He stands as a type of those who will live in these last days when every earthly support is cut off from them and yet in that hour of crisis they will maintain their integrity towards God. Amen. Brothers and sisters, Job had a patience that can endure the crisis. The question is, what was it that Job had engrafted within his very character that enabled him to actually have that patience that can endure the crisis. There's only two things I want to show you tonight. Two things. How many? Two. Here's one. Job chapter 23 and verse 12. Job chapter 23 and verse 12. In Job the 23rd chapter and the 12th verse, the Bible says, Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips, 
for I've esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. The Bible says that Job never departed from obeying God's commandments because he valued the word of God more than the food that he needed to exist. He esteemed God's word more than food. Stop for a second. Can you not see how we would need that type of character in these last days? In an hour when we can neither buy nor sell, the only way that you will not take the mark of the beast in such an hour is because you have come to value the word of God more than your life. Brothers and sisters, if you esteem God's word more than your necessary food, that means you esteem God's word more than your life. Because man shall not live by... You understand what I'm saying? But you know what I love about that scripture so much? When you look at that word, when it says he esteemed the word of God more than his necessary food, that word esteem doesn't simply mean that he valued the word of God more than the food that he needed to exist. But it means that he laid up the word of God more than his necessary food. Oh, let me explain. Let me make it real simple. Ah, you know, brothers and sisters, one of the things that I hear so many times when I travel around, especially in the States, and the people will ask, well, we know that the time of trouble is right before us, so what's the preparations we need to make? Okay, I know we need to move out of the cities, into the countries. Is that true? Yes, it's true. No, I say amen, whether you say amen or not. Amen. 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 Is this true? Okay, now do we need to get a storage shed and put a year's supply of water in there and a year's supply of food and... Brothers and sisters, these are the things that people are worried about storing up and making preparations in this direction for the crisis. But Job said he knew that one day a crisis would come to him. And Job knew when his crisis came, what he needed to have stored up was the word of God in his heart. Amen. See, brothers and sisters, we have to understand the Bible tells us in Amos chapter 8 and verse 11. Behold, the days come and save the Lord that I will send a famine in the land. Not a famine for bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the word of the Lord. There's a famine coming. So like Joseph, don't you think you should start storing up the word? Yes. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, we got to hide the word in our hearts. Because when the famine is in the land, when the spirit of God is withdrawn, when the truth is not being preached from nation to nation, then brothers and sisters, if you don't have the word of God laid up in you, then you will sin against the Lord our God. Because Jesus said, thy word have I hid in mine heart that I might not sin against thee. That's why Job held on to God's commandments. The Bible says Job never departed from the commandments of God. He was a commandment keeper. Amen. Because he esteemed God's word more than his life. That's what helped him have this patience that can endure such a crisis. Look with me again. We're looking at Job chapter 19. Job chapter 19. In Job the 19th chapter, and we're going to now look at verse 25. I know you know this scripture very well, so you can just start quoting it with me. For I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that what? At the latter day upon the earth, and though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. Listen to the words of Job and think about this. Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. First of all, he never said, I think that my Redeemer liveth. He said, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Are you listening to me right now? Job said, I know that my Redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Wait a second. Is he not talking about the second coming? How did Job know about the second coming? And when you look at the next verse, it's clear that he's talking about the resurrection. Because he said, though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh I shall see God. He knew that there would be a resurrection from the grave. How did Job know about these things? From what word? The book of Moses? The book of Revelation? Brothers and sisters, Job was the very first book of the Bible that was written. 
Job didn't read Moses. He didn't read John. So where did he get this from? It's from the Spirit of God. And he talked about something that would happen at the what? Latter? Is that past, present, future? This is a future. Ah, this is a future event. The Lord gave Job the spirit of prophecy. There's no other way he could know what was going to happen at the end of time. Unless God gave him the gift of prophecy. And look what the gift of prophecy did for him. He didn't say, I think that my Redeemer lives. No, when God gave him the spirit of prophecy, he said, I know. Brothers and sisters, when's the last time you say, you know. When people come to us and say, so you really think there's going to be a Sunday law? I don't ask and say, maybe. I say, I know. You're not even listening to what I'm saying. So you don't think there's going to be, I know. So you're trying to tell me, they're going, I know. Why? Because I have the more sure word of prophecy. I know. Brothers and sisters, when God has given us his word, we don't say if and maybe could be, should be. We say it is. It shall be. We declare it as if it is done because God declared it so it is done. Brothers and sisters, God gave Job the spirit of prophecy. Do you see what that did for him in his crisis hour? Let me explain to you what it did for him in his crisis hour because it's very clear and I know you all know, understand this. Job was going through a situation that was racking his body with pain. However, because God had communicated to him what was going to happen in the future via the gift of the spirit of prophecy. Job was able to look beyond his present circumstances and to lay hold of the promise that God said he would receive in the future if he was faithful. The spirit of prophecy strengthens us to look beyond our now to our future. So you can endure the crisis. And continue to maintain your integrity and hold fast to the commandments of God. The spirit of prophecy is the light that shines through the darkness. Jesus could not see through the portals of the tomb, we're told in the Desire of Ages. What made him go to the, what made him go to the cross? The spirit of prophecy. He had the word. Brothers and sisters, the two things that Job had established firmly in his character that equipped him to endure the crisis was the commandments of God and the spirit of prophecy. Will God have a people like that in these last days? The Bible says in Revelation 12, 17, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. But now in Revelation 19.10, concerning the testimony of Jesus Christ, the Bible says that John the Revelator fell at his angel's feet to worship him, and the angel said to him, Seest thou, do it not. For I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have the spirit, the testimony of Jesus, worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy the commandments of God and the spirit of prophecy but then the Bible speaks of these two things again with this language and you know it well Revelation 14 12 here is the patience of the saints here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus the faith of Jesus but do you see how the Bible interchanges the faith of Jesus with the spirit of prophecy did you see that did you see that was Jesus's faith established off of the spirit of prophecy brethren we saw that yesterday if you were here he said my hour is not yet my hour is not yet come my hour has come 
What was his faith based off of? The spirit of prophecy. Do you realize that everything that we've talked about this evening concerning the events that are getting ready to befall us as God's people, Jesus himself went through every one of them first? Brothers and sisters. <laughs> Do you remember when the people came to Jesus and said, Jesus, your mother and your brothers are here to see you. Remember that? Yes. And he said, what? He looked at his disciples and said, these are my mother and my brother and my sisters, those who do the will of God. He called them his brethren, right? Well, then jump over to Matthew chapter 26, and to his brethren, his own family members, he said, all ye shall be offended because of me this night. Go a little further in the chapter. Judas, betrayest thou me with a kiss? He was betrayed by his own brother. His own family members betrayed him, and his own brother delivered him into the hands of the church leaders and the hands of the state, and they took him into the synagogue where they had their council meeting. You're not listening to me right now. And they scourged him. Everything that is getting ready to befall us Jesus has already passed through. Why? Because the servant is no greater than the master. And all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Every phase that he passed through, he has told us, you will bear the same burden. But I will be there to help you bear it. And he had a patience that could endure the crisis. The faith of Jesus. I want you to see something about Jesus as we come to a close this evening. Look with me, Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews, the 12th chapter, and we're going to begin at verse 2. Brothers and sisters, the very same doors that Jesus passed through, we shall pass through. And therefore, we need to look at the example of Jesus Christ that we might be victorious as Jesus was victorious. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 12, looking at verse 2, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despised the shame, and is set down where? At the right hand of God. The Bible lets us know here that the only reason that Jesus went forward to endure the crisis of the cross was because of this joy that was set before him. If this joy wasn't there, he would not have embraced the cross. But the Bible says because this joy was set before his face, the hope of this joy was set before his face, he went forward to embrace the crisis of the cross. What was the joy then? What was this joy that enabled Christ to press forward and become the captain of our salvation? Bible tells us Hebrews chapter 2, we're looking now, Hebrews chapter 2, please. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 10, brothers and sisters, we need to see this. Because the reason that Jesus pressed forward is the reason that everyone that enters into the gates will press forward. The Bible says in Hebrews 2 and verse 10, For it became him, for whom are all things and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons, what? To make the captain of thy salvation perfect through sufferings. Wait a second. Why was the captain of our salvation made perfect through suffering? It was to bring many sons and daughters to glory. Am I correct? Yes. Jesus endured suffering for the purpose of raising up sons and daughters to the glory of God. Yes. Bible goes on to speak on this issue a little bit more. Proverbs, Proverbs. Go to your Bibles in the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chap chapter 23. Please look with me in your Bibles. Proverbs chapter 23. In Proverbs chapter 23, looking at verse 24, the word of God tells us here that the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that beginneth a wise child shall have joy of him. So the father rejoices over the righteous. Am I right? Go with me to one more scripture. Isaiah chapter 51 and verse 11. Where are you going in your Bibles? Chapter 51 and verse 11. 
In Isaiah 51 and verse 11, the Bible says, Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing unto Zion and everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and mourning shall flee away. What was the joy that was set before Christ? When the, Christ, when the cross was presented to Christ, the joy that was set before him was the fact that he knew that if he embraced the sufferings of the cross, that it would be the means by which God could liberate men and women like yourself and myself from the bondage of sin. That God could fill men and women like us with his spirit. For the Bible tells us for as many as are led by the spirit of God, they are the sons of God. He knew that sons and daughters could be risen up. And this would bring joy to the heart of the Father. He saw in his mind the vision of the Father coming up off of his throne to sing and rejoice over the redeemed. He saw in vision. Are you with me right now? He saw, it. he saw through the prophetic eyes of the word of God. He saw the redeemed coming with their white robes and their glorious crowns on their heads walking through the pearly gates shouting hallelujah and greeting the father he saw the joy of the father he saw the joy of the redeemed and he said i will bear the cross it wasn't for him it was for the joy of others the reason why he bore the cross was not for himself it was for the joy of others Bible tells us back in Hebrews chapter 12 Hebrews chapter 12 all oh, brothers and sisters the word of God tells us in verse 3 for consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye become wearied and faint in your minds? Did Jesus become wearied? Did Jesus become wearied? Hold on a second. We need to qualify, define this weariness. Are you with me right now? Because you could be answering correctly, but you could be answering wrong. Let's qualify the weariness. Are you with me right now? Go with me to the book of Galatians. Galatians chapter... Are you with me right now? Yeah. Brothers and sisters, I'll just quote the scripture. The Bible tells us in the book of Galatians, Be not weary in well-doing, for in due season ye shall reap if ye faint not. Did Jesus become weary in well-doing? Think about this. When they, when they spat in the face of Jesus, when they beat him with the cat of nine tails, did Jesus become weary in well-doing? Where was Jesus going when they spat in his face? Where was Jesus going when they beat him with the cat of nine tails? He was going to the cross to do what? To die for the very same people that spat on him and beat him. He didn't become wearied in well-doing even when the ones he was trying to do well for were trying to destroy him. What about you? Do you become wearied in well-doing? You know, we're told that Jesus did not even sin with a look. Now, brothers and sisters, I find that remarkable, totally impressive. And if there's anything above another thing that really makes me revere Jesus is that. Not even in a look. I mean, they spat in his face and he didn't even make a look like if I could do it. <laughs> Nothing. Nothing. His heart was totally for the salvation of all men, even his very own persecutors. What about us? Do you become wearied in well-doing? In the home, do you become wearied in well-doing? Now, I... I forgave him once, twice, not enough. That's it. No more. You know I'm telling the truth, though. I'm boy hit doing so many times. Brothers and sisters, be not wearied in well doing. The 
Bible says, consider him. The next time you feel as though you're wearied in doing well in the home, consider him. The next time you're getting ready to open your mouth and utter those words that you know are going to start a fire that will destroy your home. Consider him. I'm not making jokes. Because brothers and sisters, I assure you, if we consider him, many things that we do, we would not do. The Bible says consider him who endured such contradiction of sinners against himself lest ye become wearied and faint in your minds. Did Jesus literally faint? When they placed the cross on his shoulder, did he literally faint? Yes. Jesus got to the point of physical exhaustion that he literally could not bear it anymore, physically speaking. His humanity could not, he lost so much blood, he was tired from being kept up all night, beaten. He was so physically exhausted that when that cross went on him that he just Humanity could not bear under it. He literally fainted. But he was still not wearied in well-doing even when he fell to the ground. Because he was trying to bear that cross even when he fainted. You're not hearing what I said. He was trying to bear the cross. The humanity just couldn't do it. But his mind said, bear it. Listen, brothers and sisters, and listen closely. Jesus literally, literally fainted. The Bible says, consider him. Because many times when temptation comes to us, we don't literally faint, we just faint in our minds. Do you understand? All oh, the temptation comes, mm, forget it, I'm not going to Spirit of God is telling you, no, no, stop, stop, stop. No! Brothers and sisters, it's not even as if we were resisting temptation. We just give up. We just give in. That's why the Bible goes on to say in the very next verse, ye have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. When Jesus had to bear that cross, he went to Gethsemane. And he got down on the ground and we're told in desire of ages that he literally began to dig his fingers into the earth like he was going to rip the whole planet up. And what happened as he was praying? Perspiration of blood. Sweat. He literally resisted unto blood. Tell me, when was the last time when you saw an argument getting ready to ensue? Or you were tempted to steal? Or you were tempted to lie? Or you were tempted to listen to the music? Or you were tempted to go eat something you know you shouldn't be eating. Or you were tempted to go commit fornication or adultery or look at the pornography. When was the last time when these temptations came to grip your soul and you got down on the floor and began to grip the carpet, the dirt, the dust, the concrete like you were going to rip it all up? Because you were praying and saying, Lord, no, please. Because if I get off of my knees now, I'm going to sit against you. When's the last time you stayed on your knees and said, Lord, if I get up now, I perish. I can't go anywhere until I have the victory here. Yeah. The Bible says we have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. Consider him. Consider Jesus. Brethren, my sisters, the Bible says, beware of men. Yes, we need to be aware of what the world has in store for us. But the reality is, the man that you need to most be aware of, be, the man that you most, you, you know what I'm trying to say right now. <laughs> Forgive my, my tired brain. But no, it's most important. The man that you must watch for the most is yourself. It's yourself. Brothers and sisters, ourselves.
because this is the only way that we can have the patience we need to pass through the crisis. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is calling us to something greater than being focused on ourselves and our own personal salvation. God is trying to do a marvelous work through each one of us. Each and every person in this room, the Lord desires to transform by the divine agency of his grace that he might make you a trophy to present before the universe that declares his unrivaled goodness, his omnipotent power, his merciful kindness. He wants to reveal the beauty of holiness through you. And we must realize that the hour is late for us to embrace this process of gaining victory over self and esteeming God, his word, his truth, and his will for our lives more than life itself. We must fully invest ourselves in the kingdom of heaven. Tonight, if you'd like to say, Lord, I want that patience that can endure the crisis. And I realize right now, in all truthfulness, I'm not ready because my trust is not fully in God. I'm not having the relationship with the Lord that I need so that when temptation and trial comes, I don't become wearied in well-doing. I need a change of character, and I need it now. If it's your desire to commit yourself to a new relationship with the Lord, one that will furnish you with a patience that will take you through the crisis, I invite you to come down front here with me. I'd like to say a special word of prayer with you. And as you come, I ask you to pray this evening. You know, brothers and sisters, I make an appeal every night, and it's not for form or fashion. Church people, many times we, we hear these types of appeals and say, okay, this is the end of church and this is what we do. We stand up, we go down front and there's prayer. No, brothers and sisters, this has nothing to do with me. This has to, this has to do with you making a decision as to what you are going to do in your walk with the Lord. When these appeals are made, these appeals do not originate with me they come from God Amen. he is asking you do you want this type of relationship with me now I'm ready to enter into this relationship with you are you ready to commit yourself to me that's what we're talking about this evening total consecration giving yourself to Jesus there are some this evening that have not made that decision as of yet. You have not fully given your heart to Christ. You may still be fumbling and bumbling with the foolishness of this world, but in the midst of everything this night, the Lord has spoken to your heart and he's called you. He's called you to realize there is a situation that's getting ready to come that you're not prepared for, but he wants to prepare you for it. But you have to make a decision and he's calling you to make it tonight. If tonight you want to say, Lord, I want to give you my heart, my whole heart. I want Jesus to be the king of my life, and I would like to receive preparation for baptism. If that is the desire of your heart this night, I invite you to raise your hand with me. Is there anyone like that tonight? God bless you, my brother. I'll praise the Lord for you. Is there anyone else that wants to make that decision tonight before we close in prayer? <laughs> God bless you, my sister. And let's close in prayer and ask God to seal up our decisions. Father in heaven, perilous times have come. 
And though we have not seen the fullness of what Satan has prepared for us, your people, we know that it's just on the horizon. But Father, we need not fear these things because you told us in your word that not a hair of our head would perish if we keep our souls possessed in your patience, standing on the promises of you, our God. Lord, help us to be like Job, to be fully persuaded of all that you said, to esteem your truth more than our necessary food, to maintain our integrity under all circumstances and with our very lips. We will only bless your name and never sin against you, our God. We need that new experience, Father. We're not hungering and thirsting for that experience the way that we should, but Lord, give us a hunger and thirst for righteousness. For you promised you would fill it. I pray that as we leave your courts this evening, your spirit will continue to speak to each one of our hearts. In all sincerity, Lord, I'm asking that you would trouble some of our minds. Because some of us are standing here right now and we have a realization of the fact that we need you. But we don't really realize how much we need you. Because somewhere in the back of our mind, Laodicea is holding us in this mind state. Well, we're bad, but I'm still rich. I'm not that poor. We don't realize that we literally are destitute of everything that we need to make it into the kingdom of heaven. Lord, we need Jesus now to be the sovereign of our lives. And so come, Father, please bless us with the baptism of the Spirit of God and lead us in the path of eternal life. Thank you for hearing these, our humble prayers, and these things we ask in the name of power, the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you all.